There is a plant growing in your lawn right now that European populations used to survive famine for centuries. The leaves contain more protein than spinach, the dried flowers grind into gluten-free flour, and yet, in 70% of American suburbs, growing it will get you fined by your homeowners association. Why? Because in 1945, a chemical weapons manufacturer needed peacetime profits, and they realized that the easiest way to sell poison was to criminalize food. Before 1950, every bag of lawn seed sold in America contained this plant. Gardening guides recommended it. Farmers planted it deliberately. Then, in the span of a single decade, it was rebranded as a weed. The same companies that had sold it for 80 years suddenly began selling herbicides to kill it. And three generations later, you can be fined for allowing it to grow. This is white clover, Trifolium repens. And the campaign to erase it reveals exactly what happens when a survival crop threatens the bottom line of chemical dependence. Welcome to nature's lost vault. For centuries, white clover was the ultimate emergency food. When grain crops failed across Europe and famine swept the countryside, populations survived by harvesting clover leaves and cooking them like spinach. The plant grows everywhere, requires no cultivation, and produces edible leaves, flowers, and seeds from early spring through late fall. In times of scarcity, that reliability saved lives. The dried flowers and seed pods were ground into flour that could be mixed with scarce grain or used alone, a food source that was high in protein, gluten-free, and most importantly, completely free. Native American tribes recognized its value long before European settlers arrived. The Cherokee brewed clover tea to treat fevers, while the Iroquois utilized it for coughs and colds. For 2,000 years, this plant was valued not as a nuisance, but as medicine that required no money and no permission to grow. Then, in 2018, modern science caught up with ancient wisdom. Researchers published a study revealing that white clover extract inhibits the enzymes that cause blood sugar spikes. Laboratory tests measured its effectiveness against alpha amylase, the same enzyme targeted by the pharmaceutical diabetes drug, acarbose. The results were stunning. White clover was twice as effective. An IC50 value of 25 micrograms per milliliter compared to acarbose at 50 micrograms per milliliter shows this common lawn weed controlled blood sugar better than the pharmaceutical standard. But the medical potential does not stop at diabetes. A study from 2015 found that white clover extracts stopped human leukemia cells from growing in test tubes. They did not just slow growth, they stopped it. These are not fringe claims from an old herbal almanac. These are peer-reviewed studies published in respected scientific journals. The fresh leaves are packed with vitamins A, B, C, and E, along with magnesium, potassium, and calcium. You can eat them raw in salads, cook them as a pot herb, or brew the flowers for tea. But in 1945, none of that mattered anymore. The war had ended, and the companies that had spent four years developing biological weapons needed a new market. The compound in question was 2,4-D. Synthesized in 1941 as part of a secret program to destroy enemy crops, the Allies had intended to starve Germany and Japan into surrender by aerially spraying it to kill potato and rice fields. The weapon failed in its original mission, but while the chemistry failed to end the war, it succeeded in creating a massive stockpile. Germany fell, Japan surrendered, and suddenly chemical manufacturers were left with warehouses full of a selective herbicide and no war to fight. Six months later, the American chemical paint company launched Weed One, the world's first consumer herbicide. It was the exact same formula, but they selected a different target. They could not kill German crops, so they decided to kill American lawns. 
Specifically, they targeted white clover. Since 2,4-D kills broadleaf plants and clover is a broadleaf, it was the inevitable casualty. The O.M. Scott & Sons Company, known today simply as Scott's, had been selling lawn seed since 1868. For nearly 80 years, their seed mixes always contained white clover, because every homeowner expected it. It kept the lawn green, fertilized the soil, and required less watering. Then, in 1945, Scott's launched a herbicide containing 2,4-D. The company immediately faced a massive conflict of interest because they were selling seed that contained clover while simultaneously selling a poison designed to kill clover. One product had to go. The herbicide market was far more profitable, so by the 1950s, clover vanished from Scott's seed mixes. It did not disappear because homeowners complained or because clover stopped working. It disappeared because it interfered with chemical sales. To justify this shift, Scots did something brilliant. They convinced America that what they had been selling for 80 years was now ugly. Advertisements began depicting pure grass monocultures as the new ideal, glossy, uniform, and entirely green. Clover, which had been recommended in their own magazines just years earlier, was rebranded as a weed. The definition of beauty was deliberately shifted to match the product they wanted to sell. The biological function of the plant had not changed, only the marketing. White clover is a legume. It forms a symbiotic relationship with bacteria in its roots that pull nitrogen from the atmosphere and convert it into fertilizer. A healthy stand of white clover produces up to 150 pounds of nitrogen per acre every year. To put that in economic terms, synthetic nitrogen fertilizer costs about 60 cents per pound. That means a lawn with clover is generating $90 per acre in free fertilizer annually, forever. Grass needs nitrogen to stay green, and without it, lawns turn yellow and die. Fertilizer companies sell nitrogen in bags, but clover makes nitrogen for free. It also stays green through drought because its roots reach deeper than grass, and it feeds bees when almost nothing else does. Every characteristic that makes clover valuable to the homeowner makes it unprofitable for the chemical company. So the campaign was systematic. They removed clover from seed mixes and marketed herbicides using before and after photos. The before picture was a lawn dotted with white flowers, a natural, healthy ecosystem. The after picture was a sterile, uniformly green carpet. The message was clear, clover disrupts the aesthetic. Scott's was happy to sell both the impossible ideal and the poison required to achieve it. By the 1960s, a new generation of homeowners had grown up never seeing clover in their lawn seed. They had absorbed decades of advertising that defined it as a sign of neglect, so they applied herbicides every spring without question. The timing aligned perfectly with the post-war suburban expansion. The American lawn became a status symbol. A manicured stretch of grass signaled that the homeowner could afford to waste land on non-productive aesthetics. Today, the United States lawn care market generates $120 billion annually. Fertilizers account for a massive portion of that revenue because grass monocultures require constant nitrogen input to survive. The system produces nothing but expense. Clover would produce nitrogen, but clover is a weed. Homeowners associations enforce that definition with legal power. 70% of new suburban developments have HOA covenants, and many explicitly ban clover. The justification is always aesthetic uniformity, but the effect is the criminalization of self-sufficiency. You can actually be fined for growing a plant that produces free protein, free flower, and free fertilizer on land that you own, simply because three generations ago, a chemical weapons manufacturer convinced Americans that survival food was ugly. The cultural programming runs so deep that neighbors will report you to the HOA for letting it bloom. 
The ecological cost of this vanity is measurable. Managed honeybee colonies in the United States dropped from 5 million in the 1940s to just over 2.5 million in 2023, a 46% collapse. White clover flowers produce nectar that bees depend on when few other sources are available. Before the 1950s, suburban lawns functioned as distributed pollinator habitat, millions of small patches connected across neighborhoods. Then the herbicide 2,4-D removed the flowers. The insects had nowhere to feed, and populations collapsed as our yards became food deserts. But despite the chemical warfare, the plant's performance has not changed. A lawn with just 20% clover requires zero nitrogen fertilizer. It uses 30% less water. It tolerates drought, foot traffic, and shade. And it costs nothing after establishment. The leaves are edible, raw, or cooked. Harvest the young ones before flowering for the best flavor and use them in salads like spinach. The flowers are sweet. Add them fresh to salads or dry them for tea. Brewing that tea can help manage blood sugar. Laboratory tests proved it works better than pharmaceutical drugs, and it grows for free in your lawn if you stop killing it. The seed pods can be collected and ground into flour. The roots are edible when cooked. The entire plant is a complete protein source. European populations used it as survival food for centuries because it was reliable, abundant, and nutritious. Then a chemical company decided selling herbicides was more profitable than acknowledging that fact. Here is the ultimate test for manufactured preference. If a cultural norm benefits the company selling products, and that norm only emerged after the company began advertising, the norm was likely created not discovered. Americans did not spontaneously decide clover was ugly in 1950. They were taught it was ugly by the company profiting from killing it. And that lesson has generated $120 billion annually for 70 years. The irony is staggering. In 2024, Scott's actually sells clover seed. The same company that spent 70 years convincing homeowners to kill it now markets it as a sustainable lawn alternative. But make no mistake, Scott still sells far more herbicide than clover seed because the programming works. Most homeowners still believe clover is a weed. Most homeowner associations still ban it. Most lawn care companies still spray to eliminate it. The system perpetuates itself because each generation teaches the next. Parents tell children that white flowers in grass look messy and homeowners apply herbicides simply because their neighbors do. But white clover is staging a comeback. It is not happening because the industry changed. It is happening because consumers are questioning 70 years of programming. Pollinator decline is undeniable. Drought makes fertilizer-dependent monocultures unsustainable, and people are finally realizing that a plant labeled as a weed might actually be food. The laboratories confirmed it. The historical record proves it. And it is growing in your lawn right now if you have not poisoned it yet. So when you look out at your yard and see white clover flowers, understand what you are really looking at. You are seeing nitrogen fixation. You are seeing free protein that sustained famine populations. You are seeing medicine that controls blood sugar better than pharmaceutical drugs. You are seeing bee habitat in a landscape where habitat has been systematically eliminated. And you are seeing the survival crop that chemical companies convinced three generations was ugly. Because in 1945, a weapons manufacturer needed peacetime profits. And the easiest way to sell poison was to criminalize food. They succeeded so completely that you can now be fined by your homeowner association for growing a plant that might save your life during a crisis. The question is, do you still believe them? If this vault opened something for you, subscribe to Nature's Lost Vault and hit the bell. Every like and share breaks the programming. The next vault opens soon.